Okay, I'd like to call the July 20th, 2020 Longmont Water Board meeting to order. Heather, could you please start with the roll call? Sure, Todd Williams. Here. John Caldwell. Present. Kathy Peterson. Here. Roger Lang. I see you, Roger. I think you're muted though. Um, and then city staff, we have actually for Renee Davis, she's out today. Um, city staff, we have Ken Hewson. Present. Um, Wes Lowry. Present. Kevin Bowden. Here. Uh, Heather McIntyre is here. David Bell. Present. Francie Jaffe. Here. Jason Elkins. Here. And Council Member Martin. She's here somewhere. I'm here. Okay, thank you. All right, Todd. Okay, thanks, Heather. Um, the next item on the agenda is approval of the previous month's minutes um, for July 15th of 2020, or June 15th, I should say, sorry, of 2020. Were there any questions, comments on the previous month's minutes? If not, we need a motion to um, approve the June 15th, um, 2020 Water Board meeting minutes. I would so move, Caldwell. We got a motion from John and I guess a second from Kathy. Kathy. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, those are approved. The next item is the water status report. Um, Wes, is that you? Yes, so the flow at Lyons uh, this afternoon at 1.15 p.m. was 127 CFS with the 124 year historic average of 240 CFS. The call on the St. Brain is the James Ditch with an admin 6,756 or an uh, appropriation date of June 30th, 1868. The call on the main stem of the South Platte is the Fort Morgan Canal with an admin of 11,979 with an appropriation date of October 18, 1882. Button Rock is currently full and spilling. Union Reservoir is down approximately a half a foot. The local reservoirs in the basin as of the end of last month, we're at approximately 90% of capacity, which is pretty much the average when we look back in the last uh, 12 years. And I think that's all I have, unless there's some questions. Any questions for Wes? Let me scroll through here. I'm not seeing any. Okay, thank you, Wes. The next item is public invited to be heard in special presentations. Heather, um, were there any requests of public invited to be heard? We have none for today. Okay. Um, and I assume no special presentations either? None. Okay. All right, we'll keep moving. Um, next item, is there any agenda revisions or submission of documents? I have none. Okay. Um, number seven is development activity. Wes, are you going to take that the North for filing one final plan? Yes. So before the board today is the development activity known as North Star filing one final plat. It's a 34.768 acre parcel located northeast of Plateau Road and North 90, uh, 79th Street and west of Renaissance Drive and south of Clover Basin Drive. The historic water rights were transferred at time of annexation and applied proportionally over the annexation per the raw water requirement policy. North Star filing one final plat will be in compliance with the city's raw water requirement policy. Upon transfer, <clears throat> I'm sorry, upon satisfaction of the 69.466 acre foot deficit at time of final plat approval. So this is uh, slated for um, 64 single family homes and is being proposed by the uh, Ridgeline uh, Development Group. So just looking for a motion uh, to uh, that that's the deficit 
that they'll need to satisfy as part of this final plat. Okay, thank you, Wes. Is there any questions? Um, please speak up if there are. I can't. Um, my screen. There we go. Now I can see the the rest of the board. Is there any questions for Wes on the um, on this North Star filing number one final plat? Any idea how they're going to meet their deficit? So they have not said, um, but what I've been hearing by most folks is they're going to pay cash in lieu, but I've not had a further conversation with them about that. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, we need a, um, I guess a recommendation or a final, um, I guess, determination on the raw water um, um, balance requirement. Um, as specified in the write-up. Is there a motion for that, recommending that amount of deficit? I'm so moved. John, or Roger, let's go ahead and do Roger is the motion and um, Kathy is the second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that carries. Hey, Tom. All right. Yeah, go ahead. Let, just a suggestion when you're calling for all those in favor. Um, you want to try us raising our hands? Yeah, that'd be fine. Rather that's, than a verbal? Fine. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Does that work, um, I guess, Heather, for you in terms of recording the... I think if we could do both the verbal and the hand, that would be helpful. All right. All right. We'll do both. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Okay, um, so next item under general business is the Climate Action Task Force recommendation um, with water conservation. And it looks like, um, Francie, are you going to be presenting this? I will jump in for a little bit, but uh, Lisa Knobloch will actually be taking most of the presentation. Okay, great. Okay, go ahead, Lisa and Francie. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Lisa Knobloch, Sustainability Program Manager. Uh, I haven't been to your, your group for a while, so I see a couple new faces. Thank you all for giving us some time on your agenda this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to go through, I'm actually going to run through all of the recommendations. I'm not going to go into depth in any of them. I just want you all to see kind of the, the breadth of what's covered in the climate action recommendations report that came out from the climate action task force. And then the one that we'll spend the most time on is the water conservation one, as Todd mentioned. So and feel free, as I'm running through these, if you have any clarifying questions or anything, just hop in So, um, or raise your hand and I'll, I'll try to, if I can see you, uh, I'll, I'll call on you. If not, if somebody else sees a hand raise, please speak up because I can't see everybody on the screen. Uh, great, okay, Heather, you can go on to the next slide. So just to provide you all uh, some background, so the City Council passed the Climate Emergency Resolution in October of last year. It called for the convening of a Climate Action Task Force, a group of folks to get together and put together recommendations on what the city can do to advance climate action. And we that was supposed to be completed within 120 days, and because of COVID, uh, the second half of the, of the report really got delayed for a couple of months. Uh, but we completed all of our recommendations and brought them to City Council over two sessions on June 30th and July 7th. This is what the report covers. Uh, it, it's pretty extensive in terms of um, everything that it goes into, but what we'll just cover today is, is really high level of the recommendations. So Heather, you can go to the next slide. The Climate Action Task Force identified six primary topic areas that they wanted to develop recommendations in. So adaptation and resilience, building energy use, education and outreach, land use and waste management, renewable energy and transportation. And then they also identified equity as a really important consideration and really wanting to make sure that as we're taking on climate action in the city that we're doing that in an equitable way and we're being really mindful of what potential impacts any of those policies or programs or decision making could have um, on our community and different members of our community. Uh, next slide, Heather. Thank you. So we did our best to go through um, somewhat of a community engagement process to try to get some of that information of what people's thoughts were, what current community interests are around climate action, 
And then what are some potential opportunities as well as concerns? Um, we did go through, uh, we put out a community questionnaire, which we got about 350 responses back on that. Uh, we did a couple of presentations and tabling events to get community feedback. And we had some uh, kiosks that key community locations and some posters driving people to the questionnaire. Uh, but of course, right as we were in the midst of all of that, COVID happened and shut down all of our community engagement efforts uh, as, cities, as the city closed down and we couldn't do any in-person engagement anymore. Uh, next slide, please. But I did want to just share uh, the key takeaways and the limitations that we had in that process. So in general, the folks that we were able to talk to were, were pretty supportive of climate actions and incentives and changes that would go along with that. There was strong support for increasing services and benefits for low-income communities and really addressing that affordability and equity issue, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and the flip side of that is there's definitely concern about what the cost is and the impact, potential impact is on the affordability, particularly as we're looking at um, building code changes or land use changes and things like that. And then a lack of stakeholder engagement. Um, as I mentioned, the limitations really in, in the top that we only had 120 days to pull the report together. Sounds like it might be a long time, but uh, it really isn't, especially from a community engagement standpoint. Obviously the impacts from COVID. Um, the format of the questionnaire just was set up in a way that it forced people to rank certain things without giving them the option to say, I don't like any of the above that you're um, suggesting. And then, so we know through all of that that um, we got limited representation. We just want to be mindful of that moving forward, that we know there are a lot of voices and perspectives that weren't heard in this process, and we want to um, just be aware of that. Next slide. So I'm going to jump into the recommendations. Um, go ahead and switch to the next slide, please. And this is what we've done for some of the other boards. Again, the, the main recommendation that we'll be getting feedback from you on is the water conservation one. Uh, and we'll just, we'll, we'll get into the details of that and then ask for the board's agreement kind of from the thumbs up, thumb side, thumbs down perspective. And we'll chat a bit more about that in a minute and then just get your high level um, comments that we'll then take to city council. Next slide. So the first topic area is adaptation and resiliency. And the, although the majority of the recommendations in the climate action recommendations report are focused on greenhouse gas reductions, or what we call mitigation. This component around adaptation and resiliency is really important because we do know that impacts from climate change are coming, and even if we are successful at reducing our emissions in Longmont by 100% by 2030, um, we know that changes are already underfoot. We're already seeing some of those, and we want to make sure that, that our community is prepared for those. So there's three recommendations in this area. The first is focused on public health, and that's really looking at what are the potential health impacts from changes from a warming climate? So things like increased exposure days, um, poor air quality, um, potentially new diseases that might be introduced um, and understanding how we can prepare for that. The water conservation one, which is, um, and we'll get down into the details in a minute, expanding and creating new programs to achieve a reduction in water consumption, a citywide reduction in water consumption 35 to 40% by 2025, which as I'm sure you all are aware is a pretty um, pretty substantial goal in a pretty short time frame. So we, we want to talk with you more about that. And then flooding mitigation and preparedness education. And this is focused more on, on educating the public around uh, issues around um, flooding mitigation and preparedness. Um, next slide. So building energy use, um, this one is pretty, pretty straightforward and things that you can imagine. So looking at opportunities to increase energy efficiency and address issues like uh, electrification, solar readiness, EV readiness in the next building code update, which will be in 2021. Electrification, there's, I do want to clarify, there's been some confusion around this one, that this is looking at, at pulling together a feasibility committee and developing a plan over the next 18 months would help identify how long Longmont would be able to transition away from natural gas over the next 10 to 15 years or so. 
Uh, and then the remainder ones of these are focused on both commercial and residential energy efficiency opportunities, mostly through expanding our existing programs. And then the last one is, is developing a fund that would help specifically focus on low and middle income businesses and residents to help uh, support that transition and any costs and expenses that would come along with that. Slide, please. Education and outreach. Um, this is also pretty straightforward. The majority of these are focused on just that education and outreach opportunities to get folks more engaged and aware of climate issues and solutions. So through a lecture series, an article series, um, the Longmont Museum teaching exhibit. So that's expanding the Front Range Rising exhibit to include issues of climate change and sustainability. Uh, the one big kind of outlier in this section is looking at compre a comprehensive workforce development program. So we know if we want to achieve a lot of these goals that we need uh, to focus on training up uh, our workforce so that we can have staff, can we, we can have folks that are um, well trained to do energy efficiency, solar installation, all of the things that would be associated with a number of these recommendations. Next slide. Land use and waste management. Uh, there's only three recommendations here focus on uh, promoting and educating the public around uh, home scale food production, increasing recycling and composting in both the commercial and residential sector, and then a downtown pay for parking um, policy that would be looking at changing downtown to a paid parking situation to try to encourage folks to take other alternative modes of travel into and out of downtown. Um, the caveat that I put on that one this right now is that this all came about before COVID started. And we recognize that this recommendation in particular would likely need to be put on hold for quite a while until we're past the impacts of, of the pandemic on our downtown businesses. Next slide, please. Renewable energy. So this one's also uh, looking at accelerating um, smart meter installation and then a lot of different programs that are really supported by smart meters like home energy management systems, a broader energy savings program. So looking at how, how we can incentivize uh, residents to install smart technology so that we can better manage uh, and balance supply and demand. Uh, carbon intensity signaling, so that's just providing information to the consumer, real-time information about what the carbon intensity is at that moment in time so that people can make choices on when they wanna run appliances or not and then distributed energy resources. Um, so that's developing a plan and putting in place some pilot programs, um, which will help us get to our 100% renewable energy by 2030 goal. Next slide, please. And then the last section is transportation. Um, this is focused on probably what you can imagine. So increasing um, the effectiveness of our transit system through what's called a checkpoint or flexible bus service. Um, so that's allowing kind of a fixed route service to make some small detours um, to pick up folks similar to kind of a call and ride situation, increasing electric vehicle infrastructure, a connected bikeways uh, network, and then promoting alternative work schedules. Uh, so working with employers and employees to do things like telecommuting or changing work schedules to help reduce uh, congestion during peak periods. Next slide. So before we get back to the water conservation recommendation, I'm gonna hand it to Francie for a few minutes to talk about the Just Transition Plan Committee and their equity recommendations. Um, thank you, Lisa. So um, these recommendations, as Lisa mentioned earlier, um, equity was identified as an important part by the Climate Action Task Force. And one of the ways um, equity was addressed was through the Just Transition Plan Committee which worked with the um, Climate Action Task Force and developed a series of recommendations. The Climate Action Task Force recommendations were more of like what different things you can do, why these are more of a how, it's more of a process of, of um, how you can apply these recommendations to make any of the Climate Action Task Force recommendations reach more members of our community. Um, the Just Transition um, Plan Committee process actually started um, at an earlier resolution um, in 2018 um, with the transition to 100% renewable energy, which called for the city shall consider the needs of lower income residents, which kicked off this process uh, with the climate emergency resolution passing last October and calling for frontline communities or communities that are 
um, most likely um, to be negatively impacted by um, climate change, but maybe historically haven't had their voices heard, must actively participate in the planning process. So it aligned um, with the creation of the Just Transition Plan Committee already. So uh, we used the opportunity to have the Just Transition Plan Committee work towards uh, focusing on the goals of the climate emergency resolution. Next slide. So the recommendations are in two different categories. The first is the equity assessment recommendations. These are kind of the approach of like how you apply it, equity assessment. Um, the importance of providing both a foundation on equity and climate action using the equity lens, and then again, focusing on those frontline communities. Next slide. And then the bulk of their recommendations were in these overarching recommendations. And um, these eight recommendations really focus on our approach of how you can make sure the Climate Action Task Force recommendations are reaching uh, all members of the community. They range from marketing and outreach, which highlights focusing on engaging cultural brokers and creating targeted culturally relevant messaging to using data and research to identifying barriers. They also highlighted importance for equitable access to jobs and kind of these different components here. Um, a lot of their recommendations are framed as questions um, that can, that when implementing the climate action recommendations, you can apply those different questions. Um, so um, next slide. Great, all right, Heather, you can go ahead and move to the next slide. So um, as we mentioned, the recommendation that we wanna talk most with this group about is the water conservation recommendation. So there's the, the description there. And this recommendation really focuses on preparing the city for potential sustained drought conditions and impacts to water availability due to climate change by promoting and incentivizing water conservation measures such as xeriscaping and the use of native vegetation. Um, as you can imagine, it would require extensive financial resources and likely a significant redesign of parks and golf courses in order to meet this goal. And we think that further research and analysis would be necessary in order to understand the full fiscal impact of this effort and identify a feasible path forward. And before, before we get into asking your, you to provide a thumbs up, thumbs side, or thumbs down, I'm going to hand it to Francie. So she was really involved in working with the Climate Action Task Force on crafting this recommendation, and she'd be able to better give you the details and answer any questions that you all might have. So I'm going to hand it to Francie and then kind of just open it up for discussion. So first of all, I would like to know what, what do folks think about this recommendation? What are your um, thoughts, questions, concerns, uh, anything like that? Uh, Kathy Peterson here from the board. I I read the report and it, it was very impressive for the time you had to put it together. Um, I am really concerned about this recommendation, 35 to 40% um, reduction in water consumption. And um, I understand the thoughts behind it, but I'm worried about the cost to parks, trees, both of which are microclimates within our city that help with coolness and, um, you know, they, I wouldn't want to lose trees. Um, also, re, downstream water rights uh, from return flows, the agricultural community, um, and just that short window of time. I think uh, I'd like to look back a little bit on what happened in our last major drought, which was 2002 drought, and um, what kind of cuts in use on a short-term basis were uh, achieved. And uh, anyway, it's, a, it's quite a complex thing, and I think that's just a a really big leap to try. I think our people already have been cutting their water use. And um, I think to try to go for 40% reduction in um, five years, that's, that's a concern to me. 
And I consider myself an environmentalist. It's not that, but I think it's, it's a very complex issue. Lisa, this is Todd. Um, so this, oh, go ahead, John. Yeah, several things. One is, I guess, um, some issues similar to what Kathy said. This is pretty dramatic, and I'd have to see where they got the numbers. I mean, it looks like they pulled these out of thin air, and it's like, really, what? How do you get there? And the other thing. Um, did they look at the drought? We've out, we have all kinds of numbers for the drought 20 years ago. Did they really look at those numbers to see what can really happen? And why didn't this come to this question for Marsha, I guess, is why didn't this come to the water board before it went to council? I mean, to me, it just, it doesn't, you know, obviously I'm biased, but as a citizen, it doesn't, it, it cuts into the credibility of this report. Um, yeah, so I guess that's that's all I got to say right now. Can I answer that? Um, sure. I uh, first of all, I agree with you guys. Um, the uh, I I was uh, on the climate action task force, not uh, associated with this um, particular recommendation, um, and frankly none of, of the engineering work or research that you are referring to was, was done. The person who led this uh, particular recommendation was working from ideological um, standpoint, talking to people like Gary Walkner. Um, some of the uh, assumptions that were made were that the Windy Gap project would would be thrown aside and that um, uh, you know the diversions would stop happening altogether um, and so uh, the climate action task force as a whole um, actually cut um, Lisa I'm not sure I remember they cut they cut the they cut the goal significantly, but I don't remember what, what the original proposal was. Was it 50% instead of 35 to 40%? I think it was, but Francie would probably remember that better than me. Yeah. It was, it was 50%, and it was also, it was specifically 50% of just parks and golf courses, and they mm -hmm. commanded it to be overall water consumption, uh, but then cut the percentage down to 35 to 40 percent. Uh, but so it actually, even though it, it got cut to 35 to 40 percent because it moved from just parks and golf courses to overall water consumption, actually became a larger goal. Yeah, I, I think that I think that the committee of the whole, when approving it, just did not realize that that had happened. I certainly did not. Um, but uh, um, anyway. I don't endorse this particular recommendation either. We were just tired. I know it doesn't work. One thing I wanted to, this is Todd, I wanted to do, um, you know, I, I'm kind of, I'm sad that Renee Davis couldn't be here for today's meeting. I mean, she's kind of an expert in water conservation and a huge asset to the water board in that regard. Um, she did. I, I tried to get a hold of her and she sent me an email that she asked me to read. So if you guys are okay with it, um, I'll, I'll share you, share a little bit of what Renee's thoughts are on this. And then I've, I've got a few thoughts of my own, but um, <clears throat> I'll go ahead and get started. It says, first, I'm excited for the city to be taking on climate work. It is essential and city governments have an important role. As a water conservationist, I'm also glad um, the city is interested in increasing conservation efforts. I do um, have a caution, however. I am concerned that the stated goal is not attainable. Note that the 2015 Pacific Institute paper shows a 10% decline in water use between 2000 and 2010. These figures are typical for gallon per capita day um, in utilities nationwide as well as Longmont. Easily achieved savings are part of the reduction and best available technology will not result in as much reduction. Um, to aim for a 35 to 40% reduction in five years does not seem realistic to me. 
but if they can clarify how they do this, I would support it. Um, I would like to urge fellow board members towards action items two or three, and we'll, we'll get into those here in terms of the options and actions here in a second. Um, I think acceptance of the subject recommendation with technical analysis to follow could work. A safer option could be um, to recommend a revised water conservation goal based on existing water conservation plan. Um, so that was, I, I just wanted to put that out there. I mean, Renee working for Denver Water and Water Conservation, she knows a lot more about this issue than, than I do, but um, I, I think she's kind of echoing what the general comment is of John and Kathy, as well as Marsha. Um, and, and I have the same concern. I mean, I think we've had, as I understand it, we've had about 10% conservation that's been kind of um, in the water supply demand analysis to date. And we're assuming another 10% for new um, demand coming online in the future. That's 10%. We're talking three and a half to four times that amount with this this recommendation and without defining how we're going to get there I, I just don't see how we could recommend that and i agree with kathy i think the the concern i've got is what does that do to the nature of longmont um, it, it also has impacts to equity um, there's a lot of maybe the lower income i think a lot of people aren't using water maybe they don't have as much landscape that sort of thing if you have a 35 to 40 percent reduction what does that do to water rates um, and to those lower income folks. So I, I think we, we really need a lot more analysis of this before we, you know, at least I can support it. Um, and I'm also concerned with, you know, if, if this gets adopted, what does that do to our water supply planning? Um, this seems like, oh, hey, we, we think we're gonna get 35 to 40%, yet we have no plan to do that, or no, we haven't analyzed it at all that that seems reckless to me with regards to what we do. And we've got another item on the agenda today with regards to how we may meet part of Longmont's future water needs. Um, adopting a 35 to 40% reduction or assuming that that can be done would suggest that that isn't needed, yet there's no support whatsoever for that that level of, of demand reduction. So I, I I just can't support that. And I've got I have tried a little language on, on the modified, those potential options, but I'll let, I don't know if any of the other board members um, want to also chime in on this before we, we get into the potential options um, in terms of recommendations. Just a comment, Todd, to uh, John's point. If this is, uh, and I don't know if council has blessed this or not, but if in fact they have, and Marcia, you can jump in on this. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what the purpose is of using our recommendations if this thing's already a done deal further on down the line. I, I don't quite understand that situation. Marcia, do you have any comments yeah, on Roger. that? Yeah, um, Roger. It's not a done deal. Um, the, the plan, and Lisa could probably explain it better than I do, but the plan is to run it past the boards with each board in it making recommendations in its own specialty. Um, and, and then uh, there will be a, a final blessing by the council, uh, which is to adopt um, most uh, or, or, you know, the council has, has uh, options obviously, but the, but the formal adoption by the council, which would mean, um, putting the adopted recommendations on the comprehensive plan in the council work plan hasn't happened yet. Um, most of the other recommendations um, don't set initial goals like this because they recognize that, uh, you know, in less than six months, a team of, of uh, volunteers really did not have the ability to do the math and figure out what uh, what was aspirational, what was re realistic, and what was necessary. And so the first the first element of most of the recommendations is to um, do a re do some research, come out with pilots, and then have milestones over the next five to fifteen years, depending on what the recommendation is. This is really an outlier in that. It didn't do that, <laughs> um, 
but uh, again, set, uh, um, you know, was, was more based on um, climate I ideology, in my opinion, this is my opinion now, than client science. Um, the other thing is that there are some other recommendations such as um, community gardening, not solar gardening, but gardening gardening, um, and incentives for xeriscape and soil conditioning and a lot of those things are um, inconsistent with this adaptation because while some of them will end up uh, reducing water consumption, they will they will require more water consumption than this. So, yeah. um, you know, it's you my know, opinion uh, that, that this needs work and y'all ought to step up and at least make some recommendations that this needs work. Yeah, my, my, well, the only other thing I wanted to say is that when you get into something like this, for me to, you know, approve something like that, I need to, I need to see the calculations and how people are, deciding that this this is feasible and what what they're planning to do to make it feasible so i'm i'm sure a lot of that is uh not available but uh, it creates a lot of doubt in my mind uh, of the feasibility of this goal so I'll, I'll just leave it at that i don't think it was done roger i yeah i can jump in and um i um uh worked with the the group who worked on this more and the fact that i answered questions um, my understanding from their work is that um, we did provide the water efficiency master plan. We did provide the raw water master plan from 2004. Um, my understanding is that the group wanted to set a, as um, council member Martin said, a very aspirational goal, uh, but uh, there was no uh, kind of, there was no, I don't, I do not believe there are any calculations or anything that went into the numbers that were chosen um, from my understanding, because uh, I was also asking them to be more clear about acknowledging how this would impact the budget. And my understanding is that they want to set a very aspirational goal and then have staff figure out um, all the details. So this, this, to pursue this would require extensive um, analysis to that ha that just hasn't um, I don't think has been done by that group. So this is Todd. Go ahead. So this John. So Go ahead, John. on the back of a napkin, I can show you why this hurts economic development. It hurts social equity, and I can show you my garden that what it produces and the amount of my water bill that. It makes, <laughs> yeah, I believe in, I believe in gardening because I'm doing it myself, but in terms of water consumption, it makes no sense at all to have, have, have gardens. So anyway. Well, and I, I like from the um, equity standpoint, I live across the street from one of the best parks, <laughs> Roosevelt Park in Longmont. And a lot of people use that park who don't have their own lawns, who don't have their own homes. They live in apartments. It's hugely used by people who don't have access to that. And that is a community benefit for all of us. Um, I just think that's not to be diminished. I think that's something that's important to our community and I would hate to see the parks reduced in uh, the greenery that grows there in pursuit of Gary Walkner's vision, which honestly, I really don't like to even hear that he had any say in this whatsoever. I, I do have, I guess one question I've got maybe for Ken and, and Francie, and I know you're gonna get into this later on, but can you remind us what is the, Longmont has a water conservation plan, right? that's been adopted and it has a formal, uh, an amount of conservation that we are kind of forecasting or including in our, our water demand currently, correct? How much yes. is that? Um, and I guess I, I look at it of saying, we already have this as a established policy. 
you know, do we want to change from that or do we say this is our policy and if the, the, this climate action task force wants to look into additional ways to increase conservation, fine, so be it. Go ahead and analyze those and come back, but do the proper analysis, look at the impacts of that, and then we can consider it at that point. Um, but, you know, I, I think, at least from my perspective, we, I want to just kind of endorse what we already have in place. Um, I don't think, you know, changing to this without any background information just seems reckless. So, I mean, what, what is the current conservation um, plan? Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, I can answer that. I, I first, before I answer that, I do want to clarify the climate action task force is no longer meeting. Um, so if this goal or a similar goal is decided to pursue, it'd be on staff to do that research since the climate action task force has kind of met the goals of what they're doing. And then to answer your original, the first question, um, so the the goal that uh, we have that was actually first, our most recent water efficiency master plan was um, stated, uh, it was in 2017, that's still following a goal that was actually set in the 2004 water, raw water master plan to reduce our raw water supply by 10%. Um, oh, since then, um, we have um, mostly used uh, metered water and the decrease in metered water supply uh, to see if we're reaching that goal with the acknowledgement that that's not including all our raw water sources, but we have the best ability to track metered water usage. Um, I actually have some graphs from the update I was going to give later in the meeting, um, but if we're looking from uh, a five-year average from 20, if 2004 to 2009 and then uh, 2015 to 2019, we've actually had a 12% reduction in metered water consumption in that time period. Um, so we have been working forward in meeting that goal or getting close to that goal of that we have set. Um, so I could see if we're already meeting our water conservation goal, I could see that there could be the proposal to update that goal in the future since we're already meeting it. Um, I, I'm not, not to sub specifically support this goal in the Climate Action Task Force, but that is an option since we have been meeting that goal. Uh, Councilmember Martin. Um, thank you, Francie. Um, I was going to suggest uh, essentially the same thing. Maybe um, if, if we wanted to honor the intent of the task force members to have an aspirational goal, <coughs> excuse me, um, let's think about what an aspirational goal really is in terms of water use reduction, because this is an apocalyptic scenario that's that's kind of been presented and you know we'll we'll know the apocalypse when we see it but um <laughs> but but when uh, uh, add a task to the front of the thing to figure out what it would take to do a couple more percent of water reduction you know we know without too much pain uh a 10 to 12 percent reduction was achieved at least going on. So maybe pick a, a more reasonable aspirational goal and say, let's have the water staff do a study and see whether this is possible and also set some criteria for when it would need to go into effect. Because, you know, we have such diverse water supplies um, and, and essentially, you know, redundant water supplies that it's hard to imagine that we would need to do that and some of the other benefits to the city of continuing on the course that we're on uh, are probably greater, both in terms of social equity and climate action. So, um, you know, it would, be, it would be sufficient, I think, to understand what a worst case scenario aspirational goal could be um, and hear that recommendation in a couple of years. So I guess one thing, Marcia, that I was going to su suggest or, or kind of in line with that, but 
you know, we have these, we have different levels. What, what the community, what's, what in the policy, what's going to happen if we hit certain drought goals? And I guess if you want to add either, like Todd said, we can relook at those and see if we want to tighten those up or we can add, I think we've got, correct me if I'm wrong, Ken, I think we've got three levels right now. Is that correct? And if we want to add a fourth, almost apocalyptic, and then a fifth a pop, a pop, a apocalyptic level, add a, add a couple more levels. And yeah, I mean, that I guess I would suggest that we maybe approach it that way. I think that's but, a good idea, Jim. And that's in the context of the drought plan. I mean, we really have two pieces here. We have the conservation plan, which is kind of ongoing, you know, trying to reduce annual demand. And then we have the drought plan that under certain hydrologic conditions, then we, you know, do additional conservation measures beyond that. And those go kind of hand in glove, right? You try to increase efficiency as you move forward, which I totally agree with. And then if the hydrologic conditions are extreme, apocalyptic, <laughs> then you gradually increase the severity of additional conservation measures to, to try to, you know, address that. So I, I'm fine with that. One thing I, I put together some language, I'll read it and see what you guys think. It may need to, and I, I don't have kind of, um, if we need to reword this, that's fine. I said, um, so in relation to the climate action task force recommendation on water conservation goal, the Water Advisory Board recommends the City Council continue to use the current conservation level as established within Longmont's adopted water conservation plan, or Francie, however you worded that, that plan, um, for demand planning until the technical analysis and public input analysis is performed on the Climate Action Task Force Water Conservation Goal, or something along those lines in terms of additional, um, you know, kind of different levels more severe, whether it's part of the drought contingency plan or whether it's kind of on an ongoing basis. But I, I, what I'm concerned with is I want to, I want us to stick with our current water conservation master plan conservation level. That's what we're getting. We're getting 10 to 12% savings. Um, and that's what we need to plan on in the near term. Um, if we can get beyond that and we can fold that into our plans, great. But I don't want to start making, you know, different supply decisions based on, you know, something that's beyond the 10 or 12% that we've seen. So I, I think, you know, I, I'm trying to encapsulate maybe Marsha, what you're saying of, Hey, let's look at it. And maybe John, what you're saying, we can analyze that, that, Hey, we have these aspirational goals, but it's even hard to define those because we don't know what the repercussions are. So it's almost like we just need to say, Hey, we'll look at that as part of future analysis. Um, but right now, I want to kind of reiterate that we're using our current conservation plan in terms of the water supply and water demand planning for the city of Longmont. That's what my recommendation is. Any thoughts? Well, Todd, I think that's good. I, I appreciate that. Uh, I would just maybe add also the both the conservation plan and the drought mitigation plan as ongoing planning documents. That's a good point, Kathy. I like that. So, does any other Roger you got a thought? I know I'm I'm comfortable with uh, your language, Todd, and uh, and Kathy's add on to that. No, I I I don't want to create something over and above what we have already that we think is working for us. So, no, I'm very comfortable with what you suggested. Marcia, your thoughts. Um, yeah, I essentially agree. Um, I, um, I don't want to um, be unprepared in case of a high drought scenario. Um, but I also, to the, you know, to the extent that in the last two years I've learned to understand our drought contingency plan, uh, I think we would you know, part of the, the it, what's built into it is if we have a series of of years where we're in the in the high contingency plans, then then we um, change our methodology, right? So then we'd go for for um, higher levels of conservation, um, and 
the, the other thing I would like to maybe think of is, is to do an impact analysis. Um, nobody has ever really talked in my presence, and I, you know, I could have gone and read the details of, of your plans and maybe even should have, but, um, but what gets impacted? You know, um, like Lynette wanted to not have golf courses anymore, not water them. Um, and, you know, things like that, that would obviously cause an insurrection. I mean, people weren't even willing to stay off the golf courses for social distancing for three months, you know. Um, so um, it, would, it would be good, and not to do this in advance, to, but to insert into the plan some contingency analysis for what we would actually do in extreme sources that go beyond the existing drought contingency plan. Again, it would just be not a task that would be done, but an acknowledgement that there, per there perhaps is an apocalyptic scenario out there. Um, <laughs> Kathy, that's kind of the way I feel about it too. Um, you know, it's more, um, it's, it, the water, the, the water organization has really detailed contingency plans already um, that are, that are based on conditions on the ground. Am I correct in my assumption, by the way, that if the Windy Gap Firming Project went away, we would still be able to carry out all the existing plans? Um, because that's what it seems like to me. Ken, you want to speak to that? Yeah. So, so uh, Council Member Martin, are, are you referring to if if we if we didn't participate in Windy Gap farming, are the other water supply projects still viable or on the table? Or, um, yeah, I I am saying if if we continue doing what we had now and and say Wachner's lawsuit was successful, you know, so. They didn't get to build that reservoir. I, I know that that's not an outcome that anybody but the people who wrote this recommendation that. think is a good idea at this point in the history of Longmont. But um, what what I guess I'm driving at is is how much redundancy do we have in our systems? I'm just trying to look at what a debate about this would look like in council and what the people from the public uh, are going to stand up and say when the recommendation from this board is make no changes or, or maybe make some, you know, add an, a level of a aspirational contingency plans. Um, I would like to, I'd like to be able to argue for that position. And, and one of the main arguments is, is uh, an honest risk assessment associated with Windy Gap. Because sure. the project is being held up. It's behind. The risk hasn't dropped very much. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, as in any project, there is a risk that it may not go forward, especially when it includes federal permitting. And I, I get that and understand it. And yes, we have maintained our diligence in a number of different projects. Um, we certainly uh, are continuing to, to maintain our diligence in the Union Reservoir Enlargement. Um, we have the possibility of the Union Re Reservoir Pump Act. Um, we have an enlargement of uh, Ralph Price Reservoir on the books. We also have a long-standing, nearly as long as the history of Longmont, um, uh, that has greatly benefited the community, and that is we don't go out and purchase agricultural water rights and dry up the valley. And certainly you could, um, uh, you know, we have dominant eminent domain over the county on open space. So we could take their water. There's, yeah, there's lots of different areas. I would not suggest we go in, of course, any of those directions, but there's, there's lots of options. We just think we have the best most near-term, least cost option in front of us right now. 
Um, but we also um, buttress that with our water efficiency master plan and, and our water conservation efforts. Um, and, and we would be more than happy to look at all of those plans, update those in our drought contingency plans. Yeah, we can certainly do that. Um, yeah, we're, we'll never leave our community in a situation where we're dependent on any one thing or any one project. We're, we believe it's our responsibility to, to make sure that we're, we're always protecting the community. And I believe we've done that very well. Yes. Well, I believe, I believe that too. And so my suggestion is not that you go do, you know, redo all that work or anything, because I have strong confidence, uh, again, after listening to y'all for two years or more, um, that, that you have done that. Um, what I was suggesting was, let's add a, add a paragraph about just how resilient our water supply already is to um, be submitted with Todd's language. I like that. That's good, Marcia. John, you got some thoughts? <laughs> just a quick, quick story. <clears throat> so 20 years ago during the drought, we, I forget now, Ken could probably, I forget what level we went to, but we, we went, we came through, Longmont came through in pretty, well, we came through in really good shape because of our, our, our wide diversity of uh, our portfolio of water. And while we were at a level one or two, some of these other communities that were, were really short of water and the Denver me television media, which, back 20 years ago everybody in Longmont watched that so we had people voluntarily doing what the television told them to do but the television was actually talking to a different municipality than than Longmont but we had questions about well we got this drought why aren't we doing this and this because people were still able to you know keep their lawn green or water their garden or whatever because we had the resources and I guess it's kind of an oversimplification, but if you know, if we don't, if we have fewer resources like Windy Gap or whatever, when the apocalypse come, we're just we're going to run out of water that faster than if we had it. I mean, that's kind of the bottom. That's kind of the bottom line. I mean, it's pretty simple. So anyway, that's. Can I jump in quickly? Um, so if, if you all don't mind, um, I'd like to share my screen. I try to kind of summarize um, what Todd said. And then just for consistency, we're asking all boards to do thumbs up, thumbs sideways, thumbs down, just so we can have a guide that council can use for um, generally do boards love the recommendation? Do they like the concept of but want to make suggestions or do they just flat out do not want to improve it? Um, so we can add more comments from the discussion um, into this, um, but let me share my screen and then maybe we can just have that uh, that quick vote so we can at least get for consistency, the thumbs up, thumbs side, thumbs down. Um, so the main comment I have is in relation to the Climate Action Task Force, the Water Advisory Board, can, uh, I'll fix this language, to continue to use the current water efficiency master plan, drought mitigation plan, until the, a technical analysis and public input analysis has been performed on the Climate Action Task Force goal before accepting a more ambitious goal. And then I wrote paragraph to highlight how resilient our water supply already is. Um, does that seem to, and I know there's some spelling errors here, uh, but with that main comment, um, do we want to just have a quick vote of thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs side, and we can still at adjust this comment if need be. So Francie, is uh, is what you have up here, that's the sideways? Because <laughs> that's the change or the recommendation that we're coming back with. So we're, we're saying, yeah, okay, you have these aspirational goals, but this is the recommended change to that. So is that what, I'm just wondering, what are we voting here? Um, yeah, Todd, so just to jump in, that's a, yeah, it's just to clarify that, yeah, the thumbs up would essentially be approve as written, we're good to go. The thumb side would be to approve 
in concept with the following consideration, and that would be in the comments or the thumbs down is, no, we don't want to approve this at all. I have a question about interpretation, Lisa. Um, if a thumb sideways uh, adds the kind of comments that we have or, or alternative process, but leaves 35 to 40% in place across the board, um, then uh, I would go for a thumbs down under those circumstances. If, if we could, if, if the um, aspirational goal would be a smaller reduction that's, that's more realistic considering how well fixed we are for water at the present time, um, then uh, a thumb sideways would be a more appropriate vote. Uh, and I don't get a vote, so I'm just asking for an interpretation. Uh, but sure. what would the interpretation be? So what, what I would suggest, and this is just my interpretation, but I think how it would help to clarify would be for you all to specify in those comments if you think that that goal needs to be revised or there needs to be additional language to say initial analysis needs to be done and to confirm goal, confirm the goal or to revise the goal if you want to keep it as a thumb side. So we approve it with the following consideration, I would make sure that if you want to adjust that goal, that that be done in those comments in some fashion. Or alternatively, you all could vote the thumbs down to say, we don't approve this because we think this goal is, is not feasible. However, we would approve a recommendation that showed either additional analysis before setting the goal or a, low, a, goal, a lower goal with the additional analysis. So does it just... Does it if I, could, if I could quickly weigh in, I, I think that's what I'm hearing from the board is um, we're willing to continue to work on these kinds of things, but the goal is written. I'm, I'm not getting a warm, fuzzy feeling from anybody that it's a great goal. Um, so I think the last way you uh, discuss that would be what I'm hearing uh, to reflect what the board is saying. I agree with Dale. I, I think because otherwise we're, we're, <laughs> we're framing it in the context of the 35 to 40%, which I'm a big thumbs down on that <laughs> number. So I think we say no, and we're willing to look and analyze and say what is realistic, but we know that, you know, in my mind, 35 to 40% is not. So I think it's a thumb down and then here's how we reframe it. We're willing to look at additional conservation, additional drought contingency plans, but you know, we need to do the technical analysis before we can come up to a, you know, come up to a number. So I'm, I'm kind of, that's where I'm leaning is to a thumbs down and then use that language. So one thing, Todd, and you, I agree with the technical analysis, but I think we've mentioned um, there's a whole lot of issues other than technical issues. I mean, Kathy referred to a couple of them. I talked about economic development. I talked about, I mean, there's a, there's a whole basket pardon the pun of downstream effects of this thing. So yeah, technical analysis is a huge piece of it, but there's a whole bunch of social and quality of life and a whole, there's a, there's a lot of other questions that can be, have ramifications to this. I agree with you, John. It sounds like the study was trying to incorporate some of those. So I, I think we need to add that um, in as far as what is considered in the analysis. Yeah, so I think we can broaden that term analysis and then list the, the number of things, you know, technical, social impacts, quality of life impacts, whatever you all want to include in that analysis component. Anything else? Otherwise, do we want to go ahead and I guess we'll make the vote as you're asking um, if that's what you want, Lisa, so that you can record that and then we'll have the, the written um, response. It'll go to council. Is that what you're looking for here? Yep, and I think Francie took a stab at rewriting it based on the comments just provided. So I'll have her read through that and then we can take a vote. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and I just say, do we want volunteers? Because I, I know uh, uh, 
John talked about the equity and quality of life and and economic implications, and that was a pretty good paragraph. And Ken spoke a pretty good paragraph about the resiliency of the existing supplies. Um, uh, so I'm not sure it's necessary time-wise to to have Francie have to capture it all out of these comments. Maybe a couple of uh, people would like to volunteer as as Todd has already done to paragraph for her to incorporate. I guess my question on that would be to Heather about how we would go about approving that final language if that's done outside of the meeting. Oh. Yeah, I think if they were going to vote on it, it would need to be brought back at the next water board meeting in August. So I'm, I am quickly, I was taking notes here and I am trying to, to drop them in here. I probably should have done this in here. Um, but um, so I, I have been trying to drop some of those equity concerns and concerns about impact to the water supply here. I would definitely probably need uh, at least Ken to fill out this paragraph. Um, but what I have in the comment that I added before this one was that do not think the goal is realistic. Here, I'll make this a little bigger. Are willing to look at more water conservation analysis before coming up with a new number, but need to analyze the social, economic, and environmental analyses. Um, and then I tried to um, um, drop some of the equity concerns. And I can pull up these notes because um, there's also concerns about microclimates with coolness and um, so I can pull some more of these into here as well. So from a process standpoint, can we, um, is it okay for us to come up with, to do a thumbs down, I'm hearing from everybody on the particular recommendation and then bring this language back in August? Does that throw a wrench in the plan in any way? I think it throws a wrench in the timeline, but since it's a thumbs down anyway, that may not be a problem. The other thing I would like to ask is, is there a precedent for this board approving stuff by email? The process for that would be that the final language gets sent out and applying only to Todd, replying only to Todd, um, the other members say yes or no to that language, uh, which would allow it to come to, to come before council on the planned night. Sure. Um, At what, this point in time, we have no precedent for email voting and nothing in our bylaws that states that we're able to do that. Okay, some of the other boards do do that, was the reason I asked. Hmm. One, I guess the only concern I've got with just a pure thumbs down and not a response is it, I mean, I think we're saying we're willing to look at additional conservation and, you know, during droughts, but we want it to be, you know, more analysis needs to go into it on what's realistic. So I'm a little nervous about just saying thumbs down and that's all that goes to council in the near term. So I'm wondering if we go ahead and try to, you know, word it, um, it, it, I'm almost wondering, you know, so we need to add the supply um, paragraph. I'm wondering if we could even, you know, um, postpone the, the um, voting on this until later in the meeting. And Ken, I don't know if, if you have, you're on most of these, but if you had a little bit, you could type up a little something to add into that. I'm wondering if we could come up with language that we could go ahead and approve today so that it would go to council and we're not you know, just giving a pure thumbs down, we're, we're putting it in context. Yeah, I can, I can get with Francie, although I have the next item, <laughs> we need to get firming, but I can get with Francie right after that and see if we can get some together. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if we do that. I mean, we're all in agreement on how we do it. We just want the proper language in there. So it, it captures, you know, the correct message going to council. And maybe if we can get, we can go through Windy Gap. And then if you want to, Maybe even if we need to take a short break um, in the middle of the meeting for five, 10 minutes, 
get that added in, we all read it, and then we can take the official, you know, action at that point. Is that, does that sound like something that would work? Yeah, I think we could do that. So, look, Heather, here's quite, can we give, can we give Todd the authority to approve the language and do it, take a little, take a day or to take a little more time to get it right and give Todd the authority to approve it? I think so. I don't know why that would be an issue. I would suggest we do that. I think that makes more sense than uh, trying to. When do you need it, Marcia, at the for council? So we're we're coming back to council August twenty fifth. So okay. sometime before it goes back to council, but it, we wouldn't have enough time to bring it to the August meeting. So. If we could get it, I would say, you know, by the end of July at the latest, I think that we'd be fine on time. I'm good with that if, if the rest of the board is. So we could go ahead and I guess what we do is officially do the down vote subject to the language. Um, I would get the wording and then subject to my approval, then it goes um, to council at that point. Does that sound workable? The other piece of that is if you guys did want to um, officially approve it in the August meeting, you would be welcome to do that because that meeting would be August the 17th. So we could still be able to get that information to council as a pending, but then put the final approval maybe in on that Tuesday morning, the 18th. Oh. Well, okay. Why don't we do that? That, that makes sense. Yeah, let's, that makes sense. So I would we go ahead and try to get the language. I'd go over with staff. We'd get it approved. That goes to council, but it would say it would be pending. Go to the next board meeting with that language in the packet. Everybody can officially bless it at that point so that when staff goes in front of council, they can say that the water board has officially approved that or if there's any slight modifications that can be brought up at that point. That's where we're at. You know, just one comment. Todd, I think we all agree that the numbers that they propose as far as percent reduction are a non-starter. I don't know exactly how those numbers get changed or modified, but uh, as they are, I think we all feel strongly those numbers are not, I don't feel they're doable at all. So I'm just, I don't know what somebody's going to do with the numbers, but I think they ought to be looked at. Well, I think what we're doing is just doing the down vote, Roger, and then saying, you know, here's how we're qualifying it. We're willing to consider additional conservation um, through the, the, you know, additional measures through the drought uh, or the conservation master plan, as well as the drought contingency plan. Um, but we're not adopting, we're saying those numbers are unrealistic. So we're voting down on that. That's what the response is. Okay. All right. That's so fine. I guess with that, do we want? Let's go ahead and do the vote. We can do that right now. I'll get language from staff. I will approve it. That will go to council, um, and then at the next board meeting, we'll bring back that language and, and get official, you know, vote by the the water board on the official language at that point. Does that sound good? All right. Let's go ahead and um, take the the vote on the um, climate action task force recommendation on water conservation. Roger, there we go. Okay. All right, do we need anything else on that item? We, we're good there, I think. Yeah, just unless you all had any other follow-up comments on, on any of the climate action or the Just Transition Plan recommendations that you wanted to add. Otherwise, that's what we needed from you all. I think I'm, I'm good. Anything else from the other board members? Okay. All right, um, next item is 8B, which is the Windy Gap Firming Project update, Ken. Thank you, Todd. Um, yeah, before you today is, is really a combined update on the Windy Gap Firming Project, as well as a request for a recommendation to City Council uh, on moving forward with the um, final allotment contract. Today, we've been using interim allotment contracts, um, kind of some of them were by period and some of them were yearly, but about once a year, once every other year, we came in with the new interim uh, allotment contract. 
So what we have before you today is a final allotment contract that will actually be for um, participation in the project and um, moving forward. Uh, before I get into that, I'd like to give you a quick update on the current status of the project. Um, probably the most significant uh, thing that's happened most recently is the state water court filing for the project. Um, and it's probably as significant as the uh, federal lawsuit. Uh, the federal case is kind of a, almost a yes or a no type suit, uh, but the state court is really, the water court filing is really what we needed to be able to continue moving forward with the project. Um, as you may recall, there, the original filing of the Windy Gap water right and the original planning for the project there back in the 1960s and 1970s included the construction of a reservoir on the west slope of Colorado. Um, most specifically, uh, e, uh, west of Lake Granby over by Willow Creek Reservoir. Um, that reservoir would have, be, we would have pumped into that reservoir and then pumped into Granby. Um, about 21 years ago, uh, we launched the effort um, to complete the second half of the Windy Gap project, which is the firming project half of it. And one of the first things we had to do was to look at that reservoir site. That reservoir site actually had um, some critical wetland areas called fens, which were almost uh, impossible to replace. It also had uh, a few other um, uh, site difficulties with it. Um, and a, as part of the environmental impact statement process, and the, you have to study all the reservoir sites. And so that's really where we got to the Chimney Hollow Reservoir site was through studying over a hundred different reservoir sites to figure out the best site. So because we actually changed the location, we didn't change the fact that we we're ever gonna store the Windy Gap water. That was always contemplated part of the project and it was always gonna be part of the project, but we needed to change the location of that storage. Uh, also, there were a number of uh, things over the years that have, um, uh, where we now understand the, even the parent project better. Um, we needed to go back into the state water court and, and basically take what we have and make sure that um, it's, it's legal, that it, it fits within the confines of the original decree. Um, also, one of the one of the longstanding um, agreements we have with the Western Slope is that we'll include most of the permitting, most of the agreements that we've done with the Western Slope, uh, it, and inherently include them in the water right decree, so that that um, it's not just a, an agreement we've signed with them. And what happens if we don't, if you know that agreement doesn't isn't followed? it actually becomes part and parcel of the underlying decree that allows us to pull water. So, so everything that, that's been committed to, you know, over the years um, is, is included <clears throat> in that state water court filing. So a um, lot, lot of eyes on that uh, water court case on the Western Slope and uh, uh, we're, we're able to get through the water court case um, essentially unscathed. Um, and the, the referee has on, on July 6th uh, entered that decree. So that was huge. There is a 21 day period, uh, a protest period where for actual uh, opposers, actual participants in the case could come in and oppose the form of the decree, but that's not expected because everybody signed off on the form of the decree. So it would be unprecedented if they, if they filed, but it could happen. But um, after that 21 day period, then the, then the water judge on the Colorado River uh, would sign the decree and it would be a final decree. So all of that will happen before we move forward to the allotment contract. That's great news to have that timing done. That's actually extremely significant. 
And it also in that decree was the uh, uh, a decree for the connectivity channel around the Windy Gap Reservoir, which was really the, the biggest mitigation issue for the West Slope uh, to get connectivity on the Colorado River around the Windy Gap um, Reservoir pumping plant. And uh, we needed to make sure that how that was going to operate would compl also comply with state water law. And uh, that's been looked at, that's gone through, and that's included in that filing. So, so we're really good on that. Um, as far as the allotment contract, um, you have that before you in the board packet. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly lengthy one, uh, but, it, but because there's two different financing options, either a cash financing or a bond financing, uh, Longmont will, will participate in the project on a cash financing basis, but um, it's set up so you can do either. Um, the final design of the project is completed. The state engineer's office has signed off on it. In fact, they're working with the contractor on some of the submittal reviews. There's lots of equipment, things like pipelines, valves, um, mixed design for the asphalt, hydraulic asphalt core, um, placement design for the rock fill, those kind of things that, the, that has to have to be looked at. Um, and, and the state, Colorado State Engineer's Office is working with the project participants to, to look on that. Um, the Windy Gap Reservoir Connectivity Channel uh, is just completed its 30% design phase. Um, that's, that's significant because that 30% design will now go out to bid uh, and the, the final design and the construction will be a design build so the 30% design is really, if you want to think about it in terms of a, a more conventional project, it's done. I mean, that the design is done at that standpoint. Um, the, the design build is because it's such a unique uh, project and such a unique uh, construction that it will help to have a contractor on board uh, during the design phase to help with that design. Um, biggest outstanding of course, is the federal suit. Um, ironically, the, the final briefs for that case were filed on July 25th uh, of 2019. So we're rapidly approaching within a few days, a one year anniversary of the final um, arguments in that case. So the court, the court has had it waiting on a, on a, uh, decision by the judge uh, for about a year now. Typically, it's anywhere, a lot of these types of cases, it's anywhere between a year to a year and a half. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. So from that standpoint, we at least are very hopeful that we'll be getting a final decision on that case sooner than later. Um, the contractor, as you may recall, is Barnard Construction, a large firm out of Montana. Um, they're on board. They've submitted almost all of their project submittals. Um, that's re what really holds you up early on on a project. So by getting them on board, getting them on site, getting the contract submittals in, 75% um, of those have been approved through both the project uh, review board as well as the state engineer's office. Uh, about 25% of them still to be reviewed and those are actually kind of being held up a little bit right now at the Bureau of Reclamation because in addition to the state engineer's office and, and the project participants, the uh, Bureau of Reclamation, since many of the facilities touch their the CBT system, which is a federal bureau project, um, the Bureau of Reclamation has to approve those. So they're, they're still a little bit, uh, they're still working on that. But um, it's, it's pretty good that we've got the 75% done. And I, I believe we have most of the long lead items already done. So, uh, and a couple of the really super long lead items, like a couple of the valves um, were already being um, acquired because they come from, I think one of the valves come from Germany. So you wanna make sure you have that. Um, there's a power line uh, uh, for the local service, Poudre Valley REA um, has designed it. Um, there's a, 
unfortunate right away issue uh, delaying the installation right now. Uh, not a big issue. Well, the, the right of way the, the, it was going across the short part of the line goes across private property and the, and the family that owns the land. Um, it was all set up to get the right of way signed and then the family came down with COVID-19 and unfortunately put, put that all on hold. But I think we're probably past that now and I think we'll, we'll, they'll be able to move on. Uh, and then, of course, there's the WAPA power line relocation, and that's still being out. Um, WAPA is, is not going to, has indicated they're not going to do that work until after the federal suit. Um, it's unfortunate because that has nothing to do with the federal suit. The federal suit's on the reservoir, not the power line, but um, they want to wait on that. So um, that's really the, the status of the project. Um, and the pro so the project's really... Um, really well primed to be able to start moving forward um, once the federal uh, lawsuit is resolved. Um, that's one of the reasons, there's really two over, overriding reasons that were that the uh, Windy Gap Firming Project Enterprise is recommending we move forward with a final allotment contract at this time. The first is, you know, we're, we're really down to the wire and, and feel like we need to be ready to move quickly um, when, when we're finally ready. And the second is part of the funding for those who are participating in the pooled bond financing is, the, is a subordinate loan through the Colorado Water Conservation Board, uh, $90 million. It was actually money that um, they had loaned out previously um, to, I believe it was Aurora for the Prairie's Water Project that money was paid back a little early, um, as well as some other funding that CWC, they assembled that $90 million and committed it to this project. But um, right now with the state's budgeting process, there's a concern that it's possible, it's unlikely, but it's possible that might get clawed back. And, uh, and so the, the project um, the firming project uh, would like to get that money tied up a little tighter than it is right now uh, in the form of an actual loan and, and execute that loan. But you can't do that until um, a lot of contracts are signed. So the um, intent right now, uh, kind of the goal is to have a lot of contracts signed by October 1st, which will allow the um, Windy Gap firming project uh, to enter into negotiations with Colorado Water Conservation Board um, during the month of October. I, I'm sorry, did I say August 1st? I meant October 1st. Um, they want the allotment contracts by October 1st so that during the month of October they can do that negotiation with the Colorado Water Conservation Board and then hopefully be closing on that in early November or mid-November at the latest. So that's kind of why we're, we are where we are. But because of that, we're now we're, we're really at a a point where we're going to ask Water Board um, to make a recommendation. Our intent is in the July meeting to get input from Water Board on the, on the allotment contract, the escrow agreement, um, our participation level, um, give you some information on that, and then we will um, give that to City Council. Um, right now we're tentatively scheduled for August 4th um, for a study session. Uh, we'll take that to City Council, get City Council's input and recommendation from that. We would then be able to take all of that uh, back to your August Water Board meeting on our, uh, August 17th and get a final recommendation from Water Board uh, to actually whether to enter into the contract or not. Um, and, and we'll base that upon the input we get today and the input what we get on August 4th will be the form of that agreement um, that you'll see in August. And then finally, in September, um, we will take the, all of that to City Council with your recommendation, at which point um, we would hope to be able to get a final um, a vote on entering into a allotment contract. It's a little, you know, much bigger deal now, of course, since it's the final contract. Um, once we sign it, we are committed to participate in the project at whatever whatever level we have. 
So really, um, you know, I think everybody, um, both council, all water boards for 21 years have been on board and supportive of this project. And our biggest question right now is the final um, capacity recommendation. Um, there's really a couple, couple different ways we, we can do that. Um, you know, we've in the past done some based upon all existing conditions. Um, we, we know we can participate at 6,300 acre feet will be enough to, to get us to um, build out a, a, well, a planning horizon for the Longmont planning area. Um, there's an, kind of an intermediate um, uh, level, uh, which is 7,500 acre feet. Um, and 7,500 acre feet, we, we've been looking really, really strongly uh, at our uh, funding capacity at this point for the project. And without making major draconian cuts in other water projects and needed infrastructure for a water system, 7,500 acre feet is, is what we can um, support from a financial standpoint. And that's a little bit new. We haven't had that um, uh, in the past kind of being part of the consideration, but it really is now for a number of reasons. Uh, the third option is um, to stick at the current, uh, our current council direction is 8,000 acre feet. Um, that's where we've actually prepared the contract with, that's where we're, we're in the project with other participants and uh, can certainly do that, And um, but it would require a little more uh, additional input. And then finally, um, you know, other, you know, we, I can't ignore, you know, some of the climate action, ta climate change task force uh, recommendations. I can't, other options. There's um, things such as if we can't move forward with the final agreement with Fiasco and that were to go away, we actually might, you know, it would drive us to a higher amount. Uh, if we can get additional water savings, you might be able to reduce that amount. But we're not recommending any of those right now because none of that you can really put your finger on and say, we know for sure that's what the future is. So at this point, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to kind of, I, I would make a recommendation that we, we look fairly strongly at that 7,500 acre foot because that's really where we can uh, uh, financially uh, move forward with the project. So between that 7,500 8, 7, and 8,000 acre feet, I think it, it's a good area to be in. Um, and if the board would like a little more information on that financial aspects, of both uh, Barb McGreen and Becky Doyle are, were invited or on the, on the water board meeting today. So if you'd like a little more information, I'd invite either one of those to, uh, to add additional financial information if you need some. Other than that, I'd be happy to answer any questions on the project or where we are. Um, and uh, certainly would, would invite your um, advice and recommendation to both staff and the city council as we move forward. Thanks, Ken. Marcia, looks like I know we're gonna have quite a few comments here. Why don't, why don't you start us off? Uh, thanks, Todd. Uh, I just wanted to ask, and I should know this because I was on the phone, but uh, uh, has, uh, has PRPA made a decision? I'm, they've, they've announced uh, a firm closure date on rawhide of 2030. Did, uh, did they decide what they were going to do with their extra water or hang on to it? What's the story? Um, so they haven't indicated to me what they, what they do. They do know that they do believe they have a little bit higher water need than they thought um, in the past. I mean, it doesn't, even when they shut down the rawhide, they, they still have water needs. Um, and I can, I can weigh in on this. Um, Marsha, what I understand from uh, Platte River is that they are holding at their current participation level. Um, they're seeing this um, both for their water needs as well as an investment in a major asset that they own. And they understand the value of a firmed Windy Gap unit versus a unfirmed. So that's what I believe they are standing at. And I think that's where the board is at this point. Could I just second that? I Go absolutely ahead. think, I absolutely think we, that's, that's the way we should look at it. If we have to scrape money together to get 8,000 acre feet, 
you know, why would you pass on buying something at $25,000 when it's automatically worth $100,000? If we decide we don't need it, the city can get a vote. The city, they can, we can sell some of it and use that money. I mean, it's just, this, this is an investment that investment people, I mean, dream and drool over. I've never seen an investment where it was worth four times what you invest in it the minute it's finished. It's it's crazy to give up on anything, give up on any of it. And, and if I could just real quickly on that, I, I know that that is um, certainly in the West. That's what how most people look at it, right? Um, you uh, rarely get criticized for having too much water. Um, and so I understand that. I think the staff understands that. Um, I do believe we're sort of in a situation maybe similar to what we were when the city was building Button Rock Reservoir. They could have also built that dam another 50 feet higher for what today would be a fraction of the price, but they didn't think they could afford it. And so they went for the amount that they thought they really needed for the short term and the long term of their community. And so, and when I, when I look at the uh, sort of the complexity of the overall utility and the financing and trying to go to a vote this fall, uh, hoping that the city council decides to put that on the ballot, uh, we're trying to weigh everything on this. And I think a 500 acre foot shift in this particular project is rather insignificant when it comes to water supply. It is, however, more significant when it comes to the balancing of the overall utility needs. And so that's how we have come down, John. And so I, I absolutely understand what you're saying. And, uh, um, but that's, that's where we have come to with our um, overall analysis of, of everything. Roger, go ahead. Um, I'm unclear exactly what kind of financial pain moving from eight to 7,500 is. And my only other comment with this, I hate to change 8,000. This thing was botted around 6,000, 10,000, 8,000, back and forth, back and forth. And I think everybody's comfortable with the 8,000 number, but is there, I, I, I can't conceptualize how much pain is involved if we, at eight versus 7,500. Ken, I don't know if you can enlighten me or on or Dale. I think Becky can probably inform us on that as, as well as anyone. Sure. So uh, one thing I'll mention is that, you know, when, when we had arrived at that $8,000, excuse me, 8,000 acre foot figure, everything is dollars for me. Um, previously, you know, there has been a, a, a per unit cost increase since then. Um, and so what we found when looking at our overall capital plan, particularly this year as we went through the CIP process for you know, the 2021 to 2025 period, um, we found that the trade-offs for the overall capital plan were very challenging and that we weren't able to do all of the asset management projects needed for other uh, projects in the system, you know, replacing treated water storage and things like that. And uh, those, those choices and trade-offs and, and kind of getting everything into the five-year plan became uh, much simpler when, <laughs> when we reduced participation to 7,500 acre feet just as a sort of a test. Um, so I would say that there, there are significant impacts to asset management in other parts of the system in order to stay at that 8,000 acre foot level. I've got a couple of questions. Um, one is, you know, we've had quite a few development projects come in that it looks like they're maybe moving towards a cash in lieu um, of water. And, and I know that, I guess, at this point isn't guaranteed. They could um, buy Macintosh shares or something and dedicate those. But to the extent they go on a, if they do dedicate cash in lieu, is that, I assume you had a projection in there for how much cash in lieu would come in. And I don't know if you guys have looked at those projects that are kind of on the, maybe coming in in the relatively near term, how much additional cash in lieu would come in and how that compares against the, the capital needs of the, you know, the 7,500 versus 8,000. Yeah, we, um, 
Ken, I don't know if you want to jump in there too. We did have we did have a, a cash in lieu projection for this year specifically, and we're still you know collecting to get up to that level. Um, and the other thing is we would use future cash in lieu to pay against the bonds that we'll issue to uh, finance a large portion of the project. Well, and I guess one other question there isn't um, you know we've allowed. Um, non-historic, let's say Macintosh shares to come in. I mean, is there a if if we wanted to go at eight thousand, would there be the possibility of not allowing, you know, doing a change in that policy of Macintosh shares, you know, to a cash and lieu only option? I guess I'm just thinking, you know, if, if that would be a way to help finance that five hundred acre foot difference. I mean, the hard part, I guess, is. You don't know exactly when that's coming in and you're having to potentially raise rates or you're issuing bonds. So maybe that's the reason you can't do that. But once again, if, if there's, you know, if you could move towards the development paying the cash in lieu, does that change your, you know, kind of financial calculation? You know, I just hate the bunch of cash to come in, cash in lieu to come in. We've let the 500 acre foot go and then <laughs> we got the cash, but we don't have the, you know, we've reduced our participation at that point. Yeah, so so as as Becky just said, we actually did this just this year um, significantly increase our projection for cash and lieu. What, what we're finding is there just isn't as much Macintosh out there for people to pick up, and the developers are are starting to just our cash and lieu is you know compared to other cities is is lower, so it's not scaring them at all to come in and and pay our cash and lieu fee. So, and, and Becky, you can please correct me, but I think we were, before we were in the two hundred dollars to $250,000 a year range on projections of future cash and lieu, we've upped it to close to a million or so, or half a million. Yeah, so something like that. I, I did just look it up, which is why I was facing that way. But uh, so it's actually in 2019, we had budgeted that we were going to receive $750,000 in cash and lieu, and we only received seventy three. dollars so um, we're, we're sort of still making up that, that, uh, that projection. And it's, it, you're exactly right, Todd, when we um, are, are counting on certain revenues for repayment of the bonds, we, it's gotta be something really secure um, and something that we, we know is gonna be there to, to make those payments. And cash and lieu, unfortunately, is not quite predictable enough. Okay. The, the other question I have is, and it kind of gets into the final rec capacity recommendation write-up, the, the first point there says, you know, that Longmont could make ends meet essentially with 6,300 acre feet of firming storage. Can that, and I, I hate, I'm a broken record on this item, but does that include the Piesco trade as part of Longmont's water supply when you say that it could meet it with a, it does include that, does it not? It does, yes. So I guess a couple points there. One is, you know, we just got done discussing Kind of the climate action task force and you know Longmont's goal of becoming getting on 100% renewable um, power sources was it by 2030? I, I guess I just bring up keep in mind that that trade of water um, with Piesco is tied to a natural gas fired um, power plant. So to the extent you know, and, and also I think everybody's seen what's happened to the value of CBT water. To the extent that water goes away, you know, that 6,300 is not correct. Um, so, you know, that's kind of where, you know, like I said, I'm kind of a broken record on this, but that 6,300 in my mind, especially if this goes to the public or goes to council, needs to be qualified. That that is including the Piesco trade and that if that goes away, you need, you know, you know, it, we're saying if we go to 7,500 or 8,000, we're going to need that or more, which would be the Windy Gap Firming Project at 7,500 to 8,000. And then you're having to do the Union Reservoir pump back at, at some level to probably make up the balance to meet Longmont's build out demands. But what I don't want to lose sight of here is if we go down to 6,000, if that gets put on the table, then we're back to, you know, having to do a huge effort with the Union Reservoir pump back. And I know talk to Dale about this, it, it may ultimately result in having to try to pump it back to Nelson Flanders. And, and keep in mind, it's also kind of ironic because then you got more pump, you know, you got electricity demands within the city 
to use those supplies and how does that fit into your sustainability, you know, the climate action task force. So, I mean, all this stuff is kind of, you know, kind of connected in that regard, but I just wanted to make sure that 6,300 acre feet, everybody understands that's with the PSCO included. If that isn't there in perpetuity for the city of Longmont, the demand isn't 6,300. It's, you know, an increase. It, it's probably 8,000 acre feet or more that you would need affirming to make ends meet. So, Anyway, I just want to make sure everybody understands that as we, we look at this. And Todd, if I could just uh, chime in on that, I, I, we, um, we certainly have analyzed that as well. And I know Ken is working right now with the folks at Piesco to uh, determine whether or not we can uh, make all or some portion of that trade uh, one in perpetuity. Um, so that's yet to be seen. That, that certainly could come about. Uh, I think the other caveat for all of us to also keep in mind is that uh, the demands that we're looking at are uh, presumptive of going through a one in 100 year drought without any reduction in demand, which I think we would all agree um, the city would certainly step back on its demands as we head into that kind of a drought. And so it's sort of like this last discussion we had lots of complexities in, in the whole thing. I think what we're trying to do is, um, we're really down to a finessing level of, of participation. I think the other unknown that we are still faced with somewhat is the final cost of the project. I think we're much closer, you know, having a, a contractor on board now, but uh, we all know there could continue to be some additional increases. I think the staff is ready to, um, Frankly, I would say we would forego other projects to hold at this 7,500 foot level. Uh, frankly, once you sign a contract, you're, you're done. You're, you you, you got to figure out how you're going to pay for it. I'm trying to not get us set up where we um, not only stay at that, that higher level, but then we have an additional, say, cost increase that hits us. And so you know, we, we've ran, poor Becky, I feel sorry for her. I don't know how many scenarios I've, I've had you run. It was almost daily at times. And so, um, yeah, I, uh, we get it. We, we think staying uh, very close to that 8,000, which was sort of the grand comp compromise, right? Between the eight and the six and Lord knows, the last thing I wanted to do was to look at uh, changing that number yet again. Um, but um, we're very close now, and we're very close to moving this thing forward. Um, I think we'll maintain both a level of participation that will serve this city well uh, into the future. As it, it, on a, I still think a bit of a conservative side. Um, and as Ken said, there, there's no way we would ever want to leave Longmont in anything other than a good position water-wise. And so, um, it is, it isn't, uh, uh, it's, it's never the easiest thing to try to uh, make that sort of a recommendation, but um, staff absolutely also appreciates our relationship with the water board. And we certainly, um, certainly want to uh, maintain that going forward as well. I'd just like to add that I, uh, I would, think that going down to 7,500, if staff is confident that it's uh, financially conservative and that it still meets a conservative goal, I would be totally open to that. And I also think it shows a willingness to be both conservative in a financial sense. And let's face it, we're all going to be hit with big costs from COVID coming down the pike. We don't know how that's going to hit us, but also it's something we can say, we just went through this whole sustainability report and say, well, you know, we're willing to pull back a little bit on this, uh, you know, this aspirational <laughs> goal of having 8,000 feet. I think 500 acre feet is not going to uh, sink our boat. So from my standpoint, I could accept 7,500. And I agree with Kathy. It the, the one message I got from council is, you know, if, if it comes back and there's additional costs, they're going to be asking, what does that mean in terms of 
work that's not going to get done. And to the extent that, you know, that 500 acre feet is the runway, so to speak, <laughs> to make sure that the necessary work gets done and, and that you've got enough to get this project to the finish line. I'm okay with that. I, I, I want to make sure we're responsive to the, you know, albeit I think the, the cost of the windy gap firming in the context of the overall rate increase is relatively small. It all adds up. So I, I get it and I'm, I'm okay. I, I, I hear John's comments and I, I concur with those as well, but I think, you know, being kind of here in the council and what the concerns are, and I know what the discussion's going to be to, to stay at that 7,500. I, I'm, I'm okay with that from my perspective. So anyway, just my two cents. Marcia, go ahead. Marcia, did you want to say something? Yes, my space bar doesn't mute me um, or unmute me when it's supposed to. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to say this council member doesn't want to let go of that 500 acre feet anymore if you want to talk about reversals over the last three years. But, you know, an assay, as, as Dale was saying or somebody was saying was uh, that's that's four times its value as soon as you pay uh, seems like a hard thing to let go of and uh, uh, so I'd want to ask um, uh, you know what would be a best case scenario where there was enough with, without sacrificing anything major uh, to keep it at 8,000. So for example, as, as I think it was Todd, you suggested, what, what if we did really well on our cash in lieu, uh, you know, find some things like that. Um, you know, I will not defeat the entire budget over 500 acre feet of, of water, but at the same time, I'd like to look real hard. Um, you know, I like, I like having that cushion. I believe that we have a lot of room for additional converse, conservation in the way we use water now. Um, but it's just so valuable. So uh, I'd be interested in hearing uh, alternative plans when it comes before council. And, and uh, council member, uh uh, Martin, we will be happy to have that discussion. Um, and again, I, uh, we're trying to all obviously look at the totality of all things related to the water utility, as well as climate change, as well as the recommendations coming from various task forces. And um, quite frankly, the, uh, uh, the amount of input that we're getting is is greater than what we can probably even analyze with any sort of certainty or or uh, level of diligence. I, you know, when you look at 500 acre feet and you look at the uh, the firming ratio, um, uh, you know that 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 gets you down to about 200 some acre feet of water. Um, I don't believe that our analysis, engineering or otherwise can even get us that close to, to knowing that our over a seven year drought that we're gonna be within 200 acre feet of getting it right. I'd like to think in, engineers are good, but I don't think we're that good. And uh, I also think we have a number of other water supply options in our portfolio. And uh, I, for one, do still envision the day that we have the union pump back project, because I think it is, uh, even though it takes power, uh, we're also moving to renewable energy to, to move that water. And um, so I think Longmont has a very bright future. I also think I'm a strong supporter of the Windy Gap Firming Project. I think it is the best regional project in front of this city. Uh, we need to stay in it uh, uh, to the end and, and be part of it. And so we're, we're going to get criticized, I think, no, no matter how we go on this, and we, we can't really base our decisions on that. We have to base it on, you know, the, the data and the information in front of us at the time. And I know staff has uh, done a ton of work on this. And again, we're more than happy to be uh, more explicit with regards to the consequences. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm also, and I know we all are, I'm concerned about the ratepayers. 
and our ability to maintain trust with them, uh, especially during the pandemic and everything that's going on. I think, I think for them to hear from us that we're, we're really sharpening our pencils and uh, being as cautious as we can, um, uh, but still trying to do you know, the best for the long term of the city. Um, I think it's something that they would, would um, hope that we're doing. And I appreciate uh, Todd. Um, I know you feel very strongly about this as does John and you guys know I absolutely respect everything you do and what you're about. And John, you've always been sort of a mentor to me. And uh, so <laughs> help us get through this. Um, we'll figure it out. But um, it is gonna take all of us together, by the way, to get through this and to get through a uh, bond election this fall. And I, I think we all need to, um, those of us in the water industry need to really stay, stay focused on that long term. Thanks, Dale. Anybody else, any other comments? I, I'll just say that it's not gonna be the end of the world to me to go from 8,000 to 7,500 if in fact there's a lot of comfort at that level. I, uh, I hate to bounce the number around too much, but if, if you're quite confident, uh, that's not gonna be a liability with long run. I, uh, I don't have a problem with going down to 7,500. Thanks, Roger. Anybody else? I guess with that, we're down to um, making a recommendation. So, Ken, we're going to have two. Sorry, muted myself. Um, we have the allotment contract, but that's coming back. Is that right? In final forms, so I guess the question you have is if there's any comments right now on it. Yeah, if, there, um, if, if there's anything in it right now and – I apologize for its length and <laughs> um, it's it's primarily pretty standard. So yeah, if, if either any comments from the allotment contract or um, just the general concept of you know we're we're going forward right now. Um, so, but uh, I, I would say though that this this allotment contract has been about six months working on it with 13 different participants. So <laughs> there's, there's a lot into this to, to get it to where it is now. Um, and, and we don't have a huge um, window to do much change to it. But if there, if there was something in there that anybody really um, had heartburn with, let us know and we'll try to work on that. But, but I do think it's, it's pretty well, it's in good, fi good final form. Okay. Does so anybody have any comments on that document? Yeah. Okay. And then I guess the other recommendation that you're looking for is, as I understand it, it's going in early August in front of council. Is that right on the participation level? That is um, correct. So, yeah. so I guess we need a recommendation from the water board to city council as to what participation level Longmont um, should be in with regards to the firming project. Is that correct? Okay, so I mean, I think the obviously the discussion is um, it looks like 8,000 or 7,500 um, acre feet. Um, does anybody want to make a motion as to the go ahead, Roger? I'd move we uh, recommend 7,500 as our participation level. All right, Roger makes a recommendation 7,500. Is there a second? I'll second. Kathy, Kathy seconds that. Any further discussion? Speak now or hold your peace, John. Come on. <laughs> well, I mean, I think you know how, I mean, I've said how I feel and, you know, I know where it's going. And, and so, you know, I could be, you know, they've, you know, we've already been, already been called water buffalo. I agree. And I, you know, I agree with that. And, uh, you know, you know what I think, but I guess I've thought I've always been a team player and I, yeah. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm going to support the, I'll be with, I'll be, I'll be on the team. <laughs> okay. So 
Hearing anything else? Um, hearing none, all those in favor of recommending 7,500 acre feet of Windy Gap um, firming storage to city council, say aye. Aye. Raise your hand, aye. Opposed? Okay, um, motion carries. Thank you. Um, now I just gotta find my, <laughs> my itinerary here. Um, next item is 8C is cash and lieu review, um, Wes. Yeah, so um, before the board is the uh, cash and lieu valuation information. Um, so what I wanted to do was just uh, speak a little bit to uh, what's, what's different than the last uh, quarter of your review. We have received some uh, Lake McIntosh and ol oligarchy ditch transaction data. And those are reflective in those native uh, basin water rights transaction costs that are there and the average was just over 15,000 an acre foot for those and those by the way were acquisitions for people that are going to be transferring um, as non-historic to Longmont so those kind of ref reflect uh, municipal costs there. Um, as we look down on the second bullet there the cost for new water supplies, water conservation we still have at 10,600. That's a number that we're working to refine. Um, we're going to, we, we're going to have a, a presentation following this. We're going to talk about water conservation and hopefully with it sometime yet this year, we can um, update that. Um, there's a lot that goes into that as we talked about earlier uh, this afternoon of depending on your amount of water conservation, those costs go up, but for now we were, we've left that at the 10,600. Windy Gap firming project costs, those are still the same as they were before. We don't have any revised numbers or anything that suggests any, di uh, any different cost at this point in time. Um, what has changed though um, is the value that we've put for union enlargement and pump back pipeline as well as the button rock enlargement. For those two items, we looked at um, some additional costs that weren't originally in there and got some updates for things such as property acquisition, uh, planning and permitting, design and uh, mitigation. And so we brought those up. Those are uh, relative to what we would see at Windy Gap Firming. And we think um, that those are a better estimate. And so when you take those collectively, the uh, average of the cost for those is at $17,788 or the weighted average, which reflects the, based upon a dry yield would be 16,660. And just to remind everybody we're currently at 17,683, which is the Windy Gap Firming Project. And so um, all, those, uh, all those things come into play. Then lastly, the CBT allotment unit transfer cost. Um, there was a little over 300 total units that were transacted in the last quarter. The majority of which were to the uh, Northern North Weld county water district or to a developer and those come from irrigators so those the uh those costs averaged eighty thousand five hundred and forty nine dollars per acre foot so um uh and then there was no data for may um it was covid related um so those are the real numbers that i think um are important to look at and those and we tried to hear water board and update our union enlargement and pump back pipeline and button rock enlargement cost. And so those are now reflective in that, in that grid. So that's really all that I had, unless there's some questions. Are there any questions for Wes on the, the numbers? Please speak up if you need it. There you go. Now I can see everybody. Um, any questions? So, if not, right now, the, the Windy Gap um, project cost estimates the same on a per acre foot basis as our last cash and lieu. Is that right, Wes? That is correct. So, 
so if we were to stay with the same methodology, we would leave the cash and loo the same at this point. So I guess I would just ask, does anybody want to discuss changing that? Or if not, if we leave it the same, do you still want a recommendation, Wes? Um, or do we just want to go ahead and leave it? You if can we just keep give it the me same? the direction. Okay. Anybody want to discuss changing the cash and loo from the current price, which is tied to the when you get firming project cost? I don't see any. So I guess Wes will just go ahead and leave it at, um, at that number for now. Okay. Thank you. Hey, thanks for updating those costs, especially I think that helps us as we look at those other projects as well. So thanks for doing that. You're welcome. Okay. So next item um, is item nine, which is the water conservation update. And Francie, are you going to handle this one? And my video, but not my audio. Um, yes, and um, I also did want to, I know we are over, so I wanted to offer the board. I just had four short slides that I can go through quickly, or I can just email them out um, based on the board's preference. You're Sorry, I muted myself again. Do we, I say we just keep going. Does anybody have any problem with that? Let's just go ahead and go through your slides, um, Francie. Okay. So thank you. Great, Heather, can you share those? Um, great, so I'm just gonna start with kind of two um, graphs to give you an update. These are both graphs that are in the water efficiency master plan um, that I extended out through 2019. Um, that line at the top is treated water production effluent. And then the bar graphs are metered water supply. Probably the main takeaway is you, I created a trend line for that uh, total treated water production effluent since 2007. And you can see kind of, we have had that consistent decrease. And I mentioned earlier in the meeting of kind of the different percentage in reduction. I do wanna highlight there that there is that drop in 2019. Uh, and my guess that's primarily because of how much water we got last summer. Um, we didn't have like a huge increase in water conservation programs. So um, that would be my assumption. So it'll be very interesting to see what 2020 uh, water usage looks like um, since this year has been much hotter. Next slide. Um, so we can also use, look at water use per capita per day. This uses our service population, um, which is our city population. Plus we estimate the amount of um, people that are outside the city. It's a very small percentage, so um, we don't think our estimation is too off. And you can, again, see, uh, I think this even highlights even more because our water consumption has been going down as our population has been rising. Um, so if we do that five-year average since 2007, uh, we actually see an 18% reduction um, in the uh, water use per capita per day. Next slide. I just wanted to give a little update about how we did in 2019, um, as well as kind of going through since we're halfway through the year in 2020. Uh, what's highlighted in green on 2020 um, are things we're still working on by what's bold and black that are done. Um, so, uh, we did have a few, fewer garden in a box sold this year in Longmont, but I was told that our the supply actually ran out and they think more would have been sold. Uh, our WaterWise seminars got moved to be webinars and that actually we had more folks attend and we actually did uh, a new WaterWise webinar this year focused on rain barrels that was really well attended. So we'll probably um, continue to focus on that topic area. Already this year, we're close to the amount of slow the flow that we did in total last year. Again, I think that's due um, to it being a little bit drier this year. Um, our toilet program has changed. So we used to have our own toilet rebate program and then the flush for the future. So we had about 144 toilets last year. This year, we've only seen three actually rebated and with 18 folks being denied. Um, there's kind of probably a couple of reasons for that, that drop. Well, one, we're only halfway through the year. Uh, so two, we've been focusing on irrigation rebates. And these are new rebates that have started with Efficiency Works. And you can see we had 70 there, um, but also much stricter toilet rebate. We are only rebating toilets that are 1.1 gallons per flush or below. 
So um, that also may be why a reason that less folks are applying. And again, both of these rebates have been moved over to Efficiency Works. Uh, we had PACES, the Boulder County Program for Businesses. I don't have an update so far this year, but you can see the numbers from last year. Efficiency Works, we have been doing the multifamily program. Uh, we had low participation so far this year due to COVID, um, but we did have some good participation last year. And we also added a commercial multifamily toilet rebate this year, which has also had low participation. And that's mostly probably due to COVID and minimizing our outreach there. Uh, we have a couple pilot projects between last year and this year. Last year, because we hadn't launched our irrigation rebates yet, an HOA um, had wanted to participate in it last year. So we did a special pilot program from them, which I'm going to see the impact of transitioning to the MP rotator heads over the next few years. This year we're transitioning on um, 1.25 acres to waterwise turf. Uh, we're in the process of doing that right now. Uh, we're expecting to save about 50% of water on those sites. We are also working with the St. Rain Valley School District to do an indoor upgrade to see the impact of transitioning a large number of toilets in a school, which we could apply to any large building. Um, so we're working through the details with them now. And then the last other thing that we're coming up this year uh, that I forgot to mention is that we are attending water resources, engineers, planners are attending a growing water smart workshop to talk about water efficiency and land use planning at the end of August and September. Um, so that's also coming up later this year. So that's my update. Uh, any any questions on the water conservation program? Thanks, Francie. Any questions? Thank you. I think it kind of shows that, you know, there's a lot going on and as the use is dropping, I think it really shows the value of, of all the programs as well as just kind of the efficiency of, of new fixtures and development. So thank you. I think it, it really shows water's being used more and more efficiently. So thanks. Um, okay. Uh, next item is we've got items from the board review of major project listings and items tentatively scheduled for future board meetings. Any questions, comments there? Go ahead, Roger. Uh, I was wondering if we can see the details of the um, what the language or what's involved in the bond issue in that I think it's about $80 million bond issue. Is there a way we can uh, get some information on that? I'm just kind of curious how that's going to impact rates if, if it passes or doesn't pass, things like that. So I don't know, Ken, is that information available? Yeah, well, well, we have some information on it. We'll be happy to send that out. And also we'll be bringing it to the August water board meeting. Great. All for right. your consideration, both if that if August is soon enough. Otherwise, we have some preliminary information we can send you right now. Be happy to do either. Could you do both? I can do both. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll send right. out. We we did a PowerPoint to council not too long ago, so we can send that to you. Thanks. Do that. John, did you have some? Yeah, Ken, assuming the, our 7,500 goes through, who is likely to pick up our 500 feet? And I can't remember when we gave up our 2,000 and um, uh, PRPA picked it up. Do they deal directly with us or does it go through the, how does, how will that work? Um, the, yes, it will be dealing directly with us. We sold the 2,000 acre feet of capacity to PRPA for the, the cost we had put in the project to that point. And we'll do the same with the 500 acre feet. Um, so when the 2000 acre feet, when we went from 10 to eight, went to PRPA, all 2000. And then PRPA turned around and resold about 100 or 150 acre feet to Loveland, who wants to go up. Um, um, We'll, we'll have a, I'll, I'll, I'll have a conversation probably with Loveland first. Um, uh, they, they may very well want to go up. I don't know that they'll want the whole 500. If not, there's a couple other entities that will probably want to pick it up. We'll have to do that pretty quickly um, after the August 4th meeting with council. Um, I may end up, at, we may end up having to actually sign up for a little some of that if we can't sell it all and then resell it then but we're 
we'll be trying to balance that, how that will work versus how quickly we can move it. But yeah, we'll sell it directly to another participant. And then they'll, they'll, they'll sign an allotment contract with that much more water. You don't anticipate a bidding war? Right? I don't. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. Okay. Um, there are actually a number out there that want it, but um, we have our water supply review zone that kind of limits the per prospective uh, purchasers. And so there's just a few out there. Anything else? Okay. Um, next item, I guess we have informational items and water board correspondence. Uh, one note is I want to say thank you to John for continuing his tour of duty here on <laughs> water board. Um, thank you, John. And I'm, I'm glad for this meeting in particular that, that you were able to, to be part of it. So thank you for your um, continued um, involvement until I guess the city council um, starts putting new board members in place, but thank you for your continued involvement, John. Appreciate it. So that raised the question I was going to ask Marsh, Martha, Marsha, excuse me, is by next, are they going to have a replacement or are you, or do you want to, am I going to be a pain in the butt again next month or what? <laughs> what what's the, what's, is there a plan? Do we know what the plan is? Yeah. Uh, this, this Saturday we are interviewing applicants, John. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, you won't, you won't need to do this. Hate to see you go though. Well, thank you. So I just wanted to say, you know, obviously it's, uh, you know, it's been 45 years, -ish, 45 years ish. And, uh, I, you know, I've, I've learned so much and gotten so much out of this that a lot more than, than I've contributed, but, you know, I appreciate serving with everybody that I've served with, um, you know, the various, I mean, actually, so when I got on, it was, it was, uh, we heard this story was, you know, Todd's grandfather was uh, my, was a mentor, you know, and then staff, you know, was Jim Sinia and then Pete Moore and then, you know, Dale and uh, Ken. And so they're on and on and on. And it's, you know, it's, it's, they're great people and they've done a great job and Longmont has done a, over the years has done a fantastic, long before I was on the water board, done a fantastic job planning. That's why, you know, we're really fortunate to have the water resources we do. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll miss it. So anyway, thank you very much. And just one note there, are, we're still working the details, John. We do want to have a, a reception for you just to say thank you for your, your time. So thank you for, for all that. And we'll, we'll, if you're not here next month, we'll be in touch with regards to that reception. So, so thank well, you. Well, like I told Heather, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't want to cause undue work for the staff and also any potential for any health issues. So I, you know, I'd rather, pass and tell you know tell this the COVID is in the distant anyway so i've, okay. I've had that and so thank but well, thank i you think for, there were i appreciate there were the some thought, thought okay well there were some thoughts maybe doing it with distancing but we'll we'll run that by you make sure everybody's comfortable with it and then we can get it in place when it the appropriate time comes up so anyway okay, um, thank with you. that that's all i had um anything else for the good of the order I don't see any. So thank you guys. I know it was a long meeting, but a lot of, of good stuff today. So I appreciate all your participation and staying in there. So thank you guys. Thanks everybody for putting up with the long debate on the climate action task force. <laughs> no problem. Dale, did you want to say something? I do. Um, because I don't know. I, I hope I get invited to John's reception whenever that is. And I'm ready to have a beer with you, John, whenever we can have a chance. Um, <laughs> You are, um, let me see, we all owe you a great, uh, a, great, a great amount of gratitude for all of your service. And the pay wasn't the best, but <laughs> your work, John, um, made a foundational difference to this community. And uh, thank you. Yeah, that's well, true. well, thank you, I'm, I'm all, always available as long as the weather stays nice and we stay outside 
I'm always available for a beer physically distanced. So that's, that's not an <laughs> issue. So if anybody wants to have a beer physically distance, I'm, I'm ready. Roger knows that, right, Roger? Oh, yeah. We do it all the time, John, and it works well. I agree. <laughs> as, long as, you're not, well, thank you, as long as you're not thank you, guys. As long you're not drinking Corona beer, that's that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Well, thank you, guys. Have a good day. All right, bye. Bye.